Greetings, this is Ty Brown with Athletic Director U. I am joined by Dr. Derek Gregg. Dr. Gregg is the Senior Vice President of Inclusion, Education, and Community Engagement at the NCAA. Greetings, Dr. Gregg. Thanks for joining us here. Always, Ty. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. I'm, I'm actually very happy to do this video. Of course, you know, you, you come into the NCAA with a wealth of experience. You spent seven years as the Director of Athletics at University of Tulsa. It's seven years. Uh, as director of athletics at Eastern Michigan University. And of course, this is your 27th year in college athletics. So the experience you have uh, prepares you well to work in the NCAA office and come in to be able to help and do what's best, I guess, for the service of student athletes. So, so I'm happy I'm happy you're here. Thank you. Um, now, Dr. Gregg, this position, Senior Vice President of Inclusion, Education, and Community Engagement, talk to us a little bit about what that position entails, the responsibilities, everything involved with it. Well, I, absolutely. And, and a lot of people actually think that this is a new position that was just created. But the NCAA has basically had this position since the early 2000s. And it started with Dr. Dan Bogan, who a lot of people will remember that name. For me, with me, it's the first time that someone with a strict athletic background has been hired into this space. And so uh, my, my higher education experience, you mentioned the athletic piece, but the way it was described to me, and, and it's interesting with, with the timing, Kevin Warren, I was speaking to him about the position right around the time it was posted. Kevin chaired the search committee, and he mentioned it to me offhand, and we had some conversation about it. And then five days after the posting, George Floyd was killed. And so I think that this position, and I've said this before, it went from being a very important position in, in diversity and inclusion in higher education to what I think is one of the most significant positions throughout all of higher education. And mainly because of, as we know, the, the movement that was caused, and I say all the time, movements are created most times and stimulated and pushed by younger people. And Dr. Martin Luther King himself was only 26 years old when he led the Montgomery bus boycott. I use that as an example all the time. And that's what we're seeing with our student athletes across the country who have joined in on this movement. And it's not just a moment. I know that's kind of cliche. It's not a moment. It's a movement. And right. so in talking to Kevin at the end of the process, in my final interview, he did say, he said, if you are fortunate enough to get this position, you have to understand that you're leaving the last job that you had. Your position, of course, was important at Tulsa, but you're going to be joining and leading and supporting a movement. And so for me, that's what this job entails, starting with the student athletes first, being involved with them, engaged with them. The student athlete voice is very important. We're having conversations that matter, courageous conversations and things that we're talking about now on campuses that honestly, in the 30 years, almost 30 years that I've been involved in, when you include my student athlete years, I was on a campus for almost 32 years, right. starting in 1988, and we hadn't had these types of in-depth conversations with the student athletes. So very, very important, key and critical. And then we do have the NCAA eight-point plan to advance racial equity as well, but it really starts with the student athletes. And so um, just my experience with them having been a student athlete, walked in their shoes, been around coaches my entire career. I think what I bring to the table is a lot of experience. And I've been involved with a lot of the programs that I know now oversee, which is kind of surreal to me. I've been involved with the DNI space from the other side of the fence as an administrator for a long time. Right. It's, it's interesting you say that the, the position was posted before George Floyd was murdered in front of our eyes. And I, I listened to a podcast. It was, I think it was Harvard Business is Idea Cast, Harvard Business, HBR Idea Cast. And then they had a guest on there, and she said that if a position is created reacting to something that happened, the position, a uh, diversity position, the position obviously is created out of compassion, but two years down the line, the position may or may not have the authority that you wanted to have because it was created out of a reaction. But but it sounds like in this situation, the position was created well before that specific instance of police brutality happened. And and actually, you said it had been around for a long time. So you applying for it, actually thinking about applying for it before this George Floyd thing happened, before all the things happened last summer, actually makes it solid and shows that the NCAA is serious about it in terms of long term and um, making it uh, uh, something that people see at the NCAA. 
I wonder about the, you mentioned the NCAA's eight point. T- tell me about that eight point. Re- re- refresh me on what that was called. You just said the yes, eight the, point the plan. NCAA's eight point plan to advance racial equity. And, and I exactly. want to start with also one of the things that I, and I've mentioned this before too in several interviews, is one of the things that attracted me to the NCAA office is the diversity of the senior management team. And I will put our senior management team and our president's cabinet up against anybody's across higher education as far as diversity. And, and Mark Emmert, you know, he, he takes the brunt of a lot of things as it relates to the NCAA because he's the boss, obviously, and, and the buck right. stops at the top. But he doesn't get enough credit for assembling a team that's as diverse as his two main leadership teams are here at the NCAA office. And so that eight point plan that I mentioned is really which was, was drafted and, and co-signed off on by the IEC staff that I oversee. But it's several things that are very key and critical in advancing racial equity as we move forward, starting with our own internal programming. We're going to continue to have internal programming and have great programming that meets the membership's needs. And I mentioned some of those that I've been involved with before coming to the NCAA. One was the Pathway Program, which really trains uh, people to become athletic directors. And so I was on the other side of that. I was an athletic director mentee. These people are paired with athletic directors. They're paired with presidents, more importantly, at institutions. So we have that program. Also, the coaches academies on all four levels. I was involved with those before coming to the NCAA. And a lot of times I was asked to be involved because, as you can imagine, there weren't a lot of people who looked like me who were FBS athletic directors. Yes, and sir. so I would, I would always joke and tease the, the staff here, though, and say, I know you called Gene Smith before you called me. He probably told me <laughs> he didn't have time to do it. <laughs> but And then they called me, which was great because my wife even said, she said, you know, you've given so much in that space. Maybe that's, you know, you're going somewhere with that. And so being involved with the Coaches Academies, again, the Pathway Program. And then one of the big things we just had a release about is the Leadership Collective. And that is basically a, a large database where we're going to warehouse uh, people of color, candidates looking to advance in athletics. A lot of times we've heard, and we've heard this from presidents and other leaders, is that they don't know where to find qualified, experienced candidates of color for positions. And so we're going to help a lot with that. And Dee Dee Merritt, who leads our leadership and development team, she gets a lot of credit for this. She was the architect of the Leadership Collective, and it's been some time in the making, but me coming here and being able to help push it to the next level where it's live now. So right now we have 70 or 80 seasoned administrators who are in that system and reaching out to people. If, if you have five years or more of experience, we want you to get your material into DD so we can get it into the database. Very interactive. You can submit videos. You know, we can do that when I started in the business. Videos, introductions of who you are, those types of things. And then some more other things with the eight point plan, again, utilizing and connecting with our student athletes. Their voices are very key and critical. Don't want them, uh, don't want to move forward with a lot of these initiatives without their input, without having them involved. Right. We want to have everyone knows that we have an inclusion forum at the end of each year. We will going to add to that. We're going to have a consortium or a symposium that brings all these people together, all of the, the alliances that have been formed around DNI. In the past few months, particularly in college athletics, the coaches alliances, I myself was the chair of the racial um, action equity group there in the American Athletic Conference. So a lot of the conference have formed these committees. So bringing them together around the table at the end of the year, probably a two, three day experience, having student athletes involved with that, very key and critical. And then another big piece that we have when you talk about community engagement, starting here in Indianapolis, just and just today. For instance, I talked to Tamika, Tamika Catchings, who obviously is a huge name in not only college athletics, but in particular the WNBA. She's lived right. in this city. She, she came here from Tennessee, the University of Tennessee, played ball here, and she's an executive, the GM of that franchise. And we talked a lot about hiring, who's being selected, uh, who's available out there as far as the coaches level, administrators level, but her, Quinn Buckner, with the Pacers, the Colts organization, obviously, the NAACP, Urban League, and Boys and Girls Club. We recently had some connection with them and had one of these types of of Zoom calls that we've been having all over the country to engage some of the youth in the community. So a lot of those things are what we're going to be looking to advance over the next uh, coming years and the years following that. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Eight-point plan. 
community engagement, leadership collective, and a number of those, especially uh, when you talk about including student athletes. The, the leadership co collective is interesting to me. Um, you know, I worked a long time at the American Football Coaches Association, and, and you would always hear about the pipeline. There's not enough qualified candidates. And when you talk about administration, you know, I, that hearing that was probably always a, a slap in the face to if somebody like you, younger, when you were younger coming up. And it's like, what, I mean, I know, a, I know a number of people of color and women who are working and they could be qualified or could not be qualified. So I, it's almost like this collective takes away an excuse. Here is a, almost a Rolodex, for the lack of a better word, of people who, quote unquote, could be called qualified candidates for whatever position it's going to open up. I think it's an excellent idea. I, I, I am all about taking away excuses when people talk about hiring and when you talk about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I, I wonder about the is are there qualifications to be in that collective? You, you mentioned five years. Is it just after five years of experience, you can we can include you here and and you it'll be a sortable database. Or tell me about how it functions. These exceptional administrators and coaches will create profile pages that include their career achievements and leadership philosophies. And in turn, senior executives will be able to access these profiles to broaden their talent list for potential opportunities. The Leadership Collective ties to the NCAA Presidential Pledge and Inclusive Practices. From our best-in-class programming to diversity efforts such as the Leadership Collective, Leadership Development offers a comprehensive educational and professional development experience to the membership. Okay, it will be a sortable database. Uh, everybody who sends in their materials, though, they will be vetted, so there is a vetting process. Right. What you want to do when you're pushing these initiatives, obviously, is you want to have, uh, we're, everybody's important, but when you look at sub, you know, the sets of people, you want to start with the cream of the crop, and so you have to vet people find out who has what experiences, what they're looking to do, and those types of things. So we will start with more experienced people. By the end of, in a few months, we'll go more to middle management, people who have maybe three to five years of experience. I had some conversation with Stan Johnson, with MOA, about how we even started below that. The other day I had that conversation with him about entry-level people. So maybe there's some partnership with us and MOA and other organizations that can create this type of pipeline starting from graduate assistants to entry level people, because obviously those will become the people that are more experienced. So we want to keep people in the pipeline. And this is not, this is actually something that we did. A lot of the FBS athletic directors of color, we started several years ago and I mentioned people like Gene Smith and uh, in particular, Ward Manuel, Lee over at Georgetown and, and uh, Sean Frazier. We've been involved with these things for a lot of years but we didn't really have the direction that now the new Black AD Alliance that's been created, they're taking that pipeline that we kind of started several years ago, have added some things to it, have reached out to the commissioners. Um, actually, and with my boss, Mark Emmert, we'll talk to the Black AD Alliance next week. So I appreciate all the work that they're doing to help push in this space too. But that pipeline is very, very important. If you don't have a pipeline, you know, then you're right. People have an excuse to say, well, they don't exist. And I can tell you, I've been on Zoom calls like everybody else throughout the year, and and uh, the Zoom call that the coach out at San Jose State put together, the assistant coach out there that just got a diversity and inclusion award himself, and I'm very proud of him. But there were 600. It, the call that I was on, there were 600 assistant coaches. Oh, you're talking about old Coach Carter out Absolutely, there. Absolutely, yeah. Coach Carter. And mm -hmm. 600 coaches on this call, most of them of color. And so when I'm sitting there and they had uh, – they had, uh, at the time, Derek at Vanderbilt was the head coach there. They had uh, the coach out at, at at Maryland was there. Mike was yeah, on there. Likely. Yeah. And, and so it, not only did we have the assistant coaches, but we had the head coaches on the call, too. So that just proved that the people are out there. But we want to help other people who may not be as familiar with these groups of people on the other end. And so it will be a great database. They can go in. They can click on different things, different things they may be looking for, experience. Maybe if they were an administrator for football or basketball, fundraising experience is very key. You'll be able right. to click on those things in the database and get the people that you're looking for. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about gathering data, right? I'd want to be, if I was an administrator coming up through the ranks of college athletics and I wanted to put my name in this collective, 
I want to know what the people searching for people, what are they clicking on? What are they looking for? Like, give me the data of what the people who are looking for candidates, what are they clicking on? What are they looking for? Right. Because I want to make sure I try to get those experience if possible. It's not always possible. Absolutely. But some, yeah, some of the names you mentioned, Gene Smith, Sean Fraser. I know, I know a lot of these people. Of course, now you got Candace and Carla when you talk about the FBS level and a number of different women. Uh, Desiree, a number of different women and women of color throughout the years uh, and now specifically becoming more and more visible and getting more and more jobs, which we're all, which we're all happy about. I had a conversation with Gene on a podcast a little while ago, and one of the things I mentioned was, you know, he had been in positions at schools that once he had the job, then those schools realized it was OK for them to hire a person of color. You being one who in you know, eastern Michigan, uh, Gene was there before and then over at Arizona State. Now you got Ray Anderson down there. and so. I think when people are in these positions and they and they see you guys in these positions, they see that, hey, there's I mean, a person of color, a woman it can do the job just as well or even better than anybody else. So, you know, the hesitation is just uh, a, a remnant of a society that we probably need to get out of our system. Uh, you know, people who who have maybe negative things to say about this type of programming or, um, you know, I, I, I disagree with that because. I am around the examples all the time. And you mentioned the women of color and Desiree mm -hmm. a few years ago was the first woman of color that was hired as an FBS athletic director. And then Carla right. Williams has come. And then at my alma mater, Candace Story Lee, I mean, these people are very qualified. Candace has been working 20 years in athletics under David Williams for a long time, right. who, uh, you know, broke down a lot of barriers and, and things at Vanderbilt there. And so it's great to see the pipeline at work. So what we want to do is to continue to to make sure that it stops. And that's what this leadership collective is is all about. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Now, you wrote a book. Tell me the title of the book. 40 Days of Direction and Lessons uh, from the, the Talented Ten. And it's really about not just myself, because I don't like really I'm not very self-promotional. Yeah. And at the end of it, when I got to the end of it, I, I told my wife, I said, I'm just going to call it 30 days. I don't know what to do with the last the last 10 chapters. And it just hit me. I said, well, I went to school with 10 of the greatest men, uh, particularly uh, men of color that you would ever be around. And just some of the examples, Dr. Derek Payne out of Memphis, who has two dental offices there in Memphis, um, you know, Clarence Civilian, who is one of the youngest black hospital CEOs. In the country, Corey Harris, who was my my roommate, my fraternity brother, we pledged together uh, 12 years with the NFL Super Bowl champions, should be getting into the Vanderbilt Hall of Fame pretty soon. Jason Brown, who is one of the most experienced and one of the highest ranking black men in the J.P. Morgan banking system, one of the highest ranking black men on Wall Street. Those types of people, Lieutenant Colonel Brown, William Brown, uh, who just retired from the Army as a lieutenant colonel, he was in the JAG Corps there, one of the highest ranking officers, black officers in the army and a lawyer as well. And so I went to school with all of these great men. And so I said, you know, I'm going to write chapters about them and the life lessons and interact with them and, and the things that I learned from them and watching them, their role models. They've been my role model. And it's just a great guidebook is what I call it back to people um, who are trying to be successful, uh, younger people. I always want to reach back student athletes in particular. Because the things that are said in this book, I feel, really resonate with them. High school student athletes as well. High school student athletes, college student athletes. And I was able to, when we released the book back in 2015, 16, when it, whenever it was, we were able to get together collectively and visit schools. So we, we talked to the, the Vanderbilt football team. We talked to the Tennessee State football team. We went into the, the youth Tennessee State uh, correctional system and talked to youth there in, in a boys home. And so, uh, and then we went to Memphis and did the same thing in, in the school system. And so just being able to pay it forward and, and give advice and direction to student athletes, because what I say a lot of times is, and me even coming up in this business, beyond Gene Smith, uh, there was no me when I came through. And, and so, you know, we were all able to, to lean on Gene. And so I just wanted to pay it forward and always be a role model for the people coming up behind me, the young people in particular. What I found interesting about it, um, is that, you know, I always say in life, there are celebration, there are challenges you learn from, you embrace them, you learn from them and you keep moving forward. And you talked about the challenges as, in addition to the celebrations, right? Everybody 
isn't always going to be successful. We aren't always going to win at the things we try to win at doing, but we learn from those failures. And so I, I thought that that, especially in terms of being an athlete, um, but then the rest of your life, right? Beyond college, while you're in college, beyond college, in terms of uh, overcoming the challenges. There's some of us don't overcome the challenges, but in terms of just moving forward in life and embracing what life deals with, I thought that was very interesting. And actually, th that type of tale is evergreen, right? It doesn't expire because we will always deal with challenges and we will always have the celebrations to there's celebrate. No, I thought no, it was very interesting. No question about it. And what you're talking about, and I talk about all the time, is the process. And I try to tell younger people all the time, and even people my age, don't cheat the process. Right. One thing about society today is you have so many what we call overnight success stories. But but the people who and the and the things that are everlasting, like you said, in evergreen, there was a process involved. And I always continue to go back to that. Put in the work. Yep. Do what you're supposed to do. And most importantly, pay your dues. And so it's interesting because I have to tell young people all the time. They always think that guys like you and I, that we came here like this. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know? exactly. So they don't know the story. So I always go back to, I always call myself, I'm really just a poor boy from Huntsville, Alabama, who um, listened to his mom and who for, you know, I, I resonate with a lot of these student athletes. I grew up, I was poor, single mom for a while, but she impressed the, the importance of education. And she came up in a home with a, a mother and a father who, Neither of you can graduate from high school, but she herself has three degrees now. So when I went to Vanderbilt University, I knew what was expected of me. She didn't care about football, to be right. honest. Now, it was great that football paid, um, helped pay my tuition for me to go to college. And I always talk to young people about that, too. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of the opportunity, all the opportunities that you have on a campus. But there, I went through a process, and it started even before college. But in college, developed around those people I was around. And then I put in 26 years of very hard work uh, in trying to build other people, not just myself. Yes, and so, sir. you know, I wasn't born Dr. Gregg. There was a process yeah. that, that I had to go through to get to that. And um, but also being able to really benefit from the things that I've worked hard to get to. So I think if you don't cheat your process, you embrace the process, you pay your dues and do what you're expected to do. There are some great things that can happen. All right, well, Dr. Gregg, I, I'll ask you a couple questions here, and then we'll wrap. First is is the, the the Russell Rule or the Bill Russell Rule. Gloria over at the West Coast Conference, they came up with this rule, which which you got to help me out here. I think it's well, they will uh, include a someone, a person of color, or someone from a underrepresented community in, I guess, in an interview process for whatever jobs open up. Or, or coach coach me up a little bit on the Russell Rule and and it seems like the NCAA has got a little bit involved in that. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, absolutely. And you're on the right track with that. And, and hats off to Gloria. And I've also actually spoken with her in the last few weeks to commend her for pushing this forward. And basically, it's, it's like what you said. It's members of underrepresented populations have historically been excluded from these types of positions, mainly because they're not in the pipeline or they don't get an interview. And they're not a finalist or a serious finalist candidate. Kind of a spinoff of the NFL's Rooney Rule, and people have different thoughts about that. I myself, I'm very supportive of it. I think it's necessary. I think if you're not part of the pool, whether you get hired or not, you're never going to get an opportunity. You're never going to know what it's like to go through a process like that. So, so the WCC has implemented the Russell Rule, and it requires that there be someone, at least one candidate in the finalist pool for head coaching positions assistant coaching positions, athletic director positions, and even assistant and associate athletic director positions, which is phenomenal. That's never happened on this level. And we understand that the challenges that may uh, be out there across the, the country, particularly at public schools, state institutions, but the, the NCAA's Board of Governors through the CPCDE, which I'm, I'm, that's the Cultural Diversity Committee, which yeah. is from the Board of Governors. I'm actually the staff liaison to that committee. And so Dr. Mark Lombardi, I'd like to commend him for setting it up where um, it was basically moved to the Board of Governors that they too endorse the Russell Rule as a best practice. And, um, and so that's a major step for the NCAA. The Board of Governors is behind that. And again, realizing the challenges, but everyone who can be involved, we're hoping that they will be. 
And then there is some accountability that goes towards it also. Um, Dr. Richard Lapchick's group uh, will also be doing a report card for the WCC, just basically to track on how those processes went over the years. And so it's, it's very uh, key and critical. You can have initiatives, but it's also great to have accountability. And so uh, we're actually doing some discussion about having our own internal uh, Russell type of rule, not knowing okay. what we call it within the NCAA. And again, with Mark Emmert, I think it's really just kind of codifying and formalizing some things that are already happening here. And while we're talking about fairness and focus on our athletes, there's more to be done in 2021 than just finishing NIL. And, and if we're going to be fair, it means taking action where we know it matters. For example, we need to make certain that college sports is inclusive and fair to all. In particular, we have got to continue to make better progress with coaching and administrative ranks that better reflect our society and our athletes. We know full well that the numbers are not good today. Um, one of the things I learned working with Coach Taff at the AFCA internally with the, within the association and then with all its members too is that if diversity is going to be a part of your organization and it has to be important to the leader right and the leader of the organization has to emphasize it as this is important to us and this is what we're doing we're heard, we've heard on a number of instances where dr emmert has emphasized that of course he hired you in this position and the position has been around for a while but hired you in this position somebody from the field practitioner I wonder in your conversations with him prior to taking the job and then taking the job, how has that uh, manifested itself, how this is important to him? Tell me how, in, in terms of conversations with Dr. Ember, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion to the NCAA, to him as a leader for the association. Absolutely. He, he impressed the importance of the DNI space and, and social justice during the interview process. Otherwise, uh, you know, I wasn't interested in coming into a position where it wasn't going to be taken seriously and wasn't going to be supported by the person at the top. And so it, it didn't take very long for me to see how serious he is about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish here. Right. And as you know, you, you can only be as successful as your leader sometimes is going to allow you to be. So I think he's given me a great deal of autonomy. He's very supportive. And, and again, he's willing to reach out and touch and talk to and interface with all groups across uh, the association. So he's very amenable to that. And we actually had a great conversation with one of the HBCU presidents just yesterday. He and I had a one-on-one, -on -one. here's a great example. He and I had a one-on-one -on -one in the morning. We talked about some things that had been said in the Board of Governors meetings. And by the end of the day, he, I, and Donald Remy, who was also very, very supportive, the number two here at the NCAA, were on a call with this president, putting the words into action. And it took it took less than four or five hours to make that happen. So I'm very excited and very motivated by the direction that uh, Dr. Emmett is providing and, and looking forward to doing a lot of great things as we move ahead. Yeah, when you, when you put the, the, the resources, you put the influence, you put the people in place, the staff and the budget, I guess, too, you can you can do a whole lot of things and be successful. And I'll ask this final question here and then we'll wrap. Looking ahead two, three, four, five years, you know, somebody who works in diversity and inclusion uh, underlyingly wants to work themselves out of a job, right? But I wonder, like for you, what do you see? And, the, and you're relatively new to the position, so um, I don't even know if you had a chance to set two, three, four, five-year goals for what you want to do. Of course, there are some that already exist. You mentioned the eight-point plan, but for you personally, what do you see in two, three, for short-term, long-term, mid-term for the position and for your role in the position, I guess? Well, absolutely, and that goes back to the pipeline. And making sure that that leadership collective is viewed as the premier tool of, of its kind or database or whatever we are going to call it. And for that to be the one that everybody thinks about when you talk about underrepresented populations, where are the cream of the crop administrators and coaches that we built that out? That's, that's really very important. Another thing is student athlete voice and making sure that it is still very important when we get down the road four or five years. And all already, and, and I understand that some of the younger people are pro probably skeptical starting on their campuses about how important social justice is going to be two or three years from now. And in talking to a Kevin Warren, and he, he really feels like this, 
that this position itself is going to be one of the most important over a five to seven year period in higher education. And we don't, again, we don't want it to just be a moment or be a movement for those student athletes and continuing to, to, to interact with them and have them involved. And then another piece to me is the hiring process and who is being hired. Have the numbers improved? Has there been movement? Are there more men of color who have gone into the coordinator position, which is the one that naturally morphs into the head coaching position? And a lot of times, and that too is about building the, the pipeline. We have to have more coordinators in that space who can rise to the level of head coach. And so when you look at those things, and those are, those are monumental within themselves. Um, and, and looking at, again, and, and, and women and, and people of color, obviously, what strides are being made? We talked about the number of women who are involved now, but how many women do we have as athletic directors five, six years from now? It's all in the numbers to me. And so we have to have them trained. We have to have the leadership collective. We have to continue to dialogue with the people on the campuses who are making these decisions, dialogue with the search firms as well, and so and look at some of their practices. And, and then we'll have a good gauge, I think, three or four or five years from now on how well we did. But I'm looking forward to it. Again, I'm, I'm very, and I wouldn't say I'm excited. I'm very motivated. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm very driven. And to grow up in the household of a mother who helped integrate a high school back in 1965 in deep South Alabama with 30 other black students in a, in a student population of 2000, um, she's a pioneer and I come from a pioneering spirit, a pioneering household and me being sometimes the first or the only almost everywhere I've gone. I always like to say I represent the underrepresented and will continue to do so. And I, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I can speak for a number of people that know you, know the NCAA, know college athletics. We're excited that you're in a position and look forward to what you bring for the industry as a whole. I really appreciate you joining us here on Athletic Director View. Thank you, Ty. Good to see you. And I'm looking forward to getting a lot of things done in the future. Yes, sir. That was Dr. Derek Gregg. He is a senior vice president of inclusion, education and community engagement. And of course, I'm Ty Brown with Athletic Director U. And keep in mind. The role of a leader is to create and maintain an environment that people want to be a part of. And as always, be better tomorrow than you are today.